welcome to the Mad Men podcast series, a new series of podcasts we hope to provide some interesting conversations with people, find a little humour and maybe shine a little bit of light in some interesting times. My name is Jonathan Fogarty. It's a great privilege to be here and joining me as always is the incomparable Mr. Simon Reeve. How are you, sir? We're running out of adjectives, Jono. Very well. Thank you, mate. Uh, I must say a disclaimer here. I do know these people and I'm concerned that you and I are running out of friends very quickly. This could be a very short series. <laughs> it's going to be a short series. Well, it's funny you should say that. Joining us are two fascinating people. Uh, she, a journalist, news presenter uh, and mother of two. Uh, he, a two-time AFL Premiership winning uh, player and now transitioned into the coaching ranks. A big welcome to the wonderful duo uh, and parents of the fabulous Frankie and Jack, Sarah Cummings, Stuart Chu. G'day, guys. How are you? Hey. Hello. Yes, good. Yes, we're hoping that the children are quietly tucked off in bed and remain remain yeah. that way. We'll see. We'll see. <laughs> we'll see how we go. I've got to ask, uh, Sarah, to you having having the husband home in this COVID nineteen world, you, you seem to still be talking to each other. How is it all going? We are. Yeah, you know, it was really strange at first, wasn't it? It was really. You know, because I guess everyone, you get into a groove with how your life normally looks, don't you? And so, yeah, I mean, I was very used to Stewie being away a lot, working long days. Um, and then, you know, you sort of be careful what you wish for. Like, oh, I wish you could be home more. And then, then he was. <laughs> um, <laughs> and there he and, is. Yeah, here he is again. Um, and, you know, it was, yeah, I think it was a little bit. Just, I don't know. It's hard to... A bit more flexibility. It goes from this very regimented, this is what happens on a Monday, this is what happens on a Tuesday, whereas there's this newfound flexibility. So it's adjusting to that. But it's been, like, without sound, I know there's been a lot of um, heartache and hardship, but personally for us, it's it's been great. Yeah, it that, has. That time that we've got and the flexibility. Has yeah, just... Yeah, we've never really had that normal Monday to Friday or the mm. normal kind of work schedule. Mm. So to have, yeah, more flexibility in how we manage our life during this period um, has been quite nice. I think the kids have really enjoyed it. You know, we've never really had weekends sort of yeah. together at this time <laughs> of year. Like everyone, we've been forced to just chill out and um, just do simple things around the house and around the suburb and Again, obviously, we wouldn't wish this experience no. on anyone, but um, sure. we, we certainly found, you know, some positives in it for sure. Well, you're lucky. My family are like, get the hell out of here and go back to work, you <laughs> lazy bugger. I can start a podcast. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It, it, we it had, has... oh, look, to be honest, we, there were a few moments like that. I think initially, at first, the first few weeks, I found her a bit like, oh, I'm just used to doing things this way or, you know. Um, but then, then we found the groove. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Sure, it's not at the breakfast table with the whiteboard saying that kids this morning <laughs> at nine. Is there that going on or not so much? Uh, no, there's a little bit of friendly encouragement to get ready for school and that sure. sort of stuff. So, sure. but yeah, it's very well when we're we we do think we do do things a little bit differently. So Sarah loves it when she's halfway through doing something and I'm sort of halfway picking things up halfway through. So she's like, don't pick up that. Don't put that away. Need, I'm going to need that at some time the rest of the day. Yes, Stewie does like order. You know, if I'm cooking, I, I sort of, you know, there's there's method in my madness. I'm sort of, I've got stuff everywhere. Oh. And Stewie will come in and be cleaning yeah. up after me. And I'm like, where's that lemon I just cut? You know, yeah. So yeah, he does, he does like order. No, I thought, yeah, because if I'm cooking, you want, when you sit down to eat, there's, it's clean, it's tidy, you don't have to worry about it after this, except those plates. <laughs> it's, a, it's a bit of, not OCD, but I'm just like, yeah. There is, anyway. a, there is a little, like when you, came, <laughs> when you came home tonight, for instance, the after work routine is, you know, we'll say quick hello, but then Stewie likes to potter. So he'll go and, you know, take the washing off the line. I just give him 20 minutes to just potter and empty I'm the dishwasher. I'm happy to just sit on the couch and... No, no, no. That's what I said. I'm happy to... <laughs> I'm, I just sit back and he's done his little chores. There's order restored and then yeah. we can talk about the day. This is going great. We, we just call up the psychologist right now and get get them on the line as well. Yeah. I, I think it has been great, the, the perspective that it's provided for a lot of families because... Uh, as you say, Stu, that regimentation of a, of a football season, it is military-like, I'm sure, from 
the time that guys come back to training in the, in the new year. Um, but it, I, I think it's been lovely in many ways. We had that, that first round when at the end of March, uh, as all the, the COVID-19 predictions and the coronavirus cases are, are going off the charts and the projections were Australia's going to have you know, 50,000, 100,000 or whatever, there was a real sense of foreboding over that first round of the season, I found personally. And it feels like a different world already now as we're talking about sort of starting the season again. But did it put football into perspective in your household as well as it seems to have done with a lot of others? Yeah, I think so. And and then it, it, it came so quickly, I think, from... The moment the season was shut down, if you go back, say, 10 days, there was a talk of oh, maybe sometime in June it might have three weeks of shutdown. Mm. So, you know, we're thinking, OK, well, yeah, that's OK. And then three days later, it was like, well, round one might not be on. And then all of a sudden it was the season might not be on. So it just grew so quickly. Um, and I think you've got two choices, don't you? You can either look at what's going bad in the world or you can actually grab some things that are good about it. I think that's what we did. After about a week, we thought, well, okay, well, what's going to be good here is we're going to have more time, you know, more time with the kids. There's some things even from a work sense that, you know, a little bit like, you know, like this, we don't always have to get on a plane and go to Melbourne to have a meeting and mm. there'll be some positives, but it's, it's going to, everyone's attitude towards it's been different, but probably from a home sense and, work sense we've thought well what's good what's been what have we learned what have we learned from this and what's been good and what can we when we go back to the new normal let's not just go back into the same rain man Mm. routine you know like what can we actually take from this time as a positive Mm. great great message how how are you keeping the list kind of on task and fit and skin folds i mean it must have been a really uh, a, a radical change to your approach to how you sort of guide the squad around. Yeah, because I think as an industry, they are some. It's not superstition, but it is the routine, and it's um, it's been fantastic for the young men in our club to go. Nothing has to be. It doesn't have to be perfect. You don't have to do that on that day. And the, I think it took them two weeks to sort of get their heads around that. And our leaders have been fantastic, but. By and large, the, the whole group, um, highly motivated. I reckon there was a little patch there where there was a lot of uncertainty, but right at that moment, a little light at the end of the tunnel about, hey, the curve's going right down and we could be back on. So had it stretched out to the first projected of six months and going up until New Year's Eve, I think that would have tested everyone, um, but just at the right time. So we, you know, we did... Uh, sessions on Zoom, whether it was individual. We did a lot of fitness stuff on Zoom, which was good. Jumped in on there with bike sessions and that sort of stuff. So, um, yeah, it's, uh, again, what have we learned? And and such a fantastic, the young guys have learned a lot about self-sufficiency because in the industry, they're so well supported. Um, but, you know, they had to fend for themselves a little bit. Uh, John Owen, Stu, I can say unequivocally that uh, Sarah is most definitely one of the nicest people in, in our industry, in the, in the television industry. And we've had lately, uh, just in the last couple of weeks, a really interesting um, intersection of your life, Sarah, and Stu's as well, where you were doing some reporting on your husband. I did. Uh, I know. Well, this is the beauty because I've obviously done a lot of TV reporting, but this is the beauty. I'm doing a bit of radio now and a bit of, you know, um, digital reporting. And the beauty of that is I can get my phone. And you can't escape it, Simon. <laughs> I can shove it in Stewie's face and I can hear wow. it. Uh, <laughs> my first 10.30 p.m. interview. <laughs> Just come down from having a share and says, are you ready to do that interview yet? <laughs> Oh, yeah. What do I say? <laughs> <laughs> so yes, I, I, I did interview Stewie for a story on um, uh, was it last half the weeks of blending in? Was, was last this week or last week? Yeah. Um, yeah, when it was announced uh, that the the um, four interstate teams would be coming up to the Gold Coast, which you know was obviously great for the AFL, but um, you know it's great for the 
um, tourism industry, obviously up here on the Gold Coast as well. So yeah, I interviewed Stewie about that and wrote a story mm -hmm. on, um, and also the players returning to training because um, yeah, after eight weeks in isolation, it was, I think it was newsworthy. <laughs> you should have said how notoriously difficult he is to talk to as well. <laughs> well, I gave a couple of inside snaps, Simon, so just to get that, smooth that over. Yeah, you did. I was like, I need some photos, I need some photos. So he was, he was out on the training ground sending me photos that I could, yeah. Good. Because I've Sorry. always been interested, Sarah, as the as the partner of a, an AFL coach, are you sitting at home on a Sunday saying, gee, you forwarded the front 50 too much, I need to talk to him about... <laughs> That interchange was ill-advised or you've got a couple of hats you're wearing here. Yeah, do you know, it's funny. I kind of, I feel like I should know a lot about football um, and that I should understand all of the rules completely. And to be perfectly honest, I don't. <laughs> and I'll often, you know, even when we're watching the football together, I'm like, well, why did that happen? Why happened there? Shouldn't that be blah, blah? And it's like... No. Yeah, nah. Um, so to, <laughs> to be honest, I'm still um, I, I'm still learning about the game, and so no, I certainly let Stewie be the expert. <laughs> I mean, I you know I give him my opinion on certain things, but um, yeah, I, I you know I love it. I love the football, and I've grown to love it um, over the years. But no, I'm certainly no expert. I really st am still learning the rules, to be honest. Yeah. yeah. Scoreboard's the only one that matters, though. John exactly. <laughs> there you go. Cliche 101, that beautiful. <laughs> yeah, that, that'll be the drinking game for the next podcast. Uh, oh. And how you going? All right. Really well done. Thank you. Thank you. You've have so, been under, under the pump, though, haven't you? When, when I was going for the Gold Coast job and Sarah was getting peppered from people at Channel 7 and even Channel 7 in Adelaide, weren't you? Like, what's yeah. happening? It was the inside goss, yeah. Well, under... Yeah. under serious pressure yeah that that is a bit well, you know was a little bit difficult but yeah. i think most people understand there's only you know obviously your family comes first so you're not going to give yeah work an exclusive over your family. <laughs> so yeah if you did it would be the last one probably anyway <laughs> <laughs> um so you guys met in Adelaide and, and you've, you've tracked through some amazing times, Stu, in your own career from Port to, Haw to Hawthorne to Sydney as a coach and then up here. Um, what has that ride been like? Because there are very few players and coaches with the depth of experience that you have, especially finals experience. It's an amazing story. Yeah, I sort of feel, I feel a bit humbled and... I don't know the word, but I guess appreciative now. When you're going through it, um, you probably don't learn the lessons until later. And the art of reflection, when I was, to be honest, when I was in my 20s, probably not one of my strong suits. So, but until once you finish your career, you start to look back on all the little situation, the ups and downs and the waves of emotion. And, and I guess coming from Adelaide and a couple of years in Melbourne and then moving up to Sydney and... You know, I think the best thing for me personally was was to get out of my comfort zone and out of Adelaide. And, you know, I feel like that that, that was life-changing. And then obviously moving up, we did long distance for a year and then the decision to move up to Sydney, um, you know, and I was probably, I was uncertain of what I was going to do, to be honest. Sarah had had her work and, and by chance I knew someone that had worked at Sydney and, and made the contact with Paul Ruse and it, and it fell into place so very appreciative of that so I, I said part of me feels like I've been in the right place at the right time on numerous occasions and and then you just play your part as a, as a, a collective. Mm. Jono? Yeah no it's interesting and some really strong characters have, have shaped your career I know and, and Paul Ruse and and John Longmire, how much, how much do you pick up and how much do you leave behind? How much of the, the Stuart Jew coaching approach is 100% yours? And, and, you know, how much do you bring with you from some of those men that you've, you've worked with, do you think? Yeah, I've been lucky enough with, with Mark Williams, um, as you Mark mentioned, Williams. Paul Ruse and, and John and obviously Alastair Clarkson. It's... Mm -hmm. It's funny, sometimes, you know, even as an assistant coach, you find yourself doing things that they did. And again, you look back and go, well, was I doing that? Because that's what happened to me. And you grab things that feel natural. And then sometimes you do things you're like, no, that's, that's not me. I just tried to be like Clarko. I tried to be like 
Mark Williams was. So I think, I guess that's the, the word of experience, isn't it? Once you get through, you, you become more and more your own person. You grab little bits along the way. But I find with the coaching stuff and certainly Clarko um, and, and Ruzi were big on everyone's different. Whereas when I played, it was one size fits all year. They got the stick or the pat on the back. So um, nowadays, it's just a combination. You're constantly weaving through um, coaching individuals differently. Sarah, I grew up in Perth where you're living in the footy bubble, the, the Dockers or the Eagles over there. You guys in Adelaide, much the same with the Crows in Port. Melbourne, of course, is, is like that as well. Much less so in Sydney when, when you guys moved to Sydney and even less so here on the Gold Coast. How, from your perspective, Sarah, dealing with the club and all the footy issues and, and the media and so on, how do you find it? Oh, well, you know, it's funny because I, obviously, yes, I grew up in Adelaide, um, but not really in a footy family. My family wasn't all that, you know, interested in football, to be honest. My older brother was, but, um, you know, as a family, we had never gone to the football. So it wasn't sort of a part of my life until really I started working um, at Channel 7 in Adelaide and then obviously covering the football quite a lot. Um, and, yeah, I, but it still was a little bit foreign to me. It was just something that other people... I don't know, did and enjoyed. The other half. The other, yeah. The other half of yeah. yeah. Um, and so I really, I guess I didn't experience like Stewie did living in that and, you know, and working in that football bubble. Um, so I, I can't really, you know, I didn't have that experience. And then when we did start dating, Stewie was in Melbourne and I was already living in Sydney. So again, I sort of didn't really experience the Melbourne football bubble. I guess a little bit I did when yeah. I would come down for weekends and I'd sort of, you know, would be having dinner and people would be coming up to Stewie and I just sort of, again, still thought, oh, gosh, it's a bit unusual. Um, <laughs> so, so, yeah, and then Sydney, obviously, um, you know, it's traditionally been an NRL state and so I think it was a very healthy environment, um, uh, which, you know, I really... Um, and I guess both of us yeah. really enjoy because mm. it allows our family to live just a normal life. And then, as you said, yeah, moving up to here to the Gold Coast. And that was one of the factors, I guess you could say, in, in Stewie choosing um, this role, uh, one of many, obviously. But we really think living outside of a football state is certainly a huge benefit to us as a family because it just allows us to be a normal family and yeah. not have that other outside noise and attention, which, you know, I think can be a little detrimental, particularly for young kids. I don't, I think it's really hard for kids to probably comprehend and wrap their head around. So we're very fortunate in that regard that we can just go about our lives up here. And I think it's, it's healthy for us as a family, our kids, but I also think it's really helpful for the players. I think mm. it just from, you know, from me observing, I think it just allows them to, go about their business and do their job and um, maintain a sense of normality. Yeah. Mm. And I'm interested in, to, to you both, but Stewie, the, the culture and, and the journey to the Gold Coast, um, you know, it's a team that hasn't, hasn't got the deep history to fall back on. It hasn't had a, a great period of success. Uh, you know, was that a daunting thing for you both to come up here leave all of that behind and and you know you're really rolling the dice or you're backing yourself i guess depending on your, your world view aren't you yeah and it was um i guess at the time well number one to even apply for the job you want to make sure that if you get the job that you're ready to go and when i say you're ready it means we're both ready and the whole family's ready because it is it's obviously a big job, regardless whether it's Gold Coast or somewhere else. Every every team's got a different story, but I think to do something like this, it's it's all in. You know, you've you've got players coming over for dinner, you've got things to go to quite often, and then over and above, actually, Sarah's there's two boys living about three houses down, so Sarah's been itching to go and help them out, and I'm like, let them. They're gonna have to make mistakes. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, it's got to be a all of family thing because there is a little bit more scrutiny, and even though we are on the Gold Coast and that's a little bit less, there's still the internet, and then also your family. I think cop it as well, to be honest, because everyone's got an idea or a, um, a different theory as to how you can do it better. Um, but in terms of the job itself, uh, I guess 
when they had been poor for a while. And obviously, whenever you're changing coach, it's really rare that you're coming into a club that's flying. So you know there's a bit of a challenge and it may take, you know, two, three, four years to turn the list over and staff and the culture and the environment. So we'd love just a nice little run at it, though, because first year was um, the Gold Coast Commonwealth Games. Um, so the first 10 weeks was away. Yeah. Um, that was interesting. And, and now this challenge has been thrown up, but this everyone's going through this. So I guess the, the other one was a little bit one out. Sarah, from your perspective, when Stewie started playing club footy in, in Adelaide many, many years ago, the culture that Jonathan referred to within clubs was very different, but also around football, the culture was very different. And, and women were pretty much, uh, not always, but pretty much sort of pushed to the outside of clubs. And it was a very blokey atmosphere, I'm sure. Cut to 2020, when the Suns have a, a wonderful AFLW team on board as well. How do you speak to that, of, of the changes that have occurred and, and what you see of the vibe around the club, especially now that there is a, a wonderful women's team up here as well? Yeah, that's certainly been um, really exciting, actually, to be part of that, the inaugural um, women's team debuting this year. That was, um, yeah, that was a really special moment. I think not just for football, but just women, you know, in general. I think it's been um, such an important uh, moment to be part of. Moving up here and, and becoming part of the club, it's been very inclusive. It's sort of, we feel very fortunate again, and that it's like it's been an instant family, an instant community, which is really nice when you're moving into state and don't know many people. I think, Simon, you were one of the only people I knew up here when you were up here on the yeah, Gold Shame Coast. for you guys, but, you know, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, you know, yeah, um, a football club becomes, yeah, it's an instant, instant community and certainly um, women are a big part of that, you know, and yeah, it just feels like we're, we're equal. Certainly the partners are, are really very much an important part of the club. The football manager started at the same time as Stewie and, and uh, John Haynes and his wife Janelle moved up at the same time um, as us and Mark and Lynn Evans moved up just a little bit before us. So, you know, there were a few of us women who'd moved up from interstate and um, we formed a really nice connection straight away. We've and been to every coffee shop. We, on yes. The <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the that important was our, stuff. Our initial... Supporting sort of, local businesses. Exactly. Absolutely. Every Monday it was the four of us, actually. Shara as well, who is Simon, um, the CEO's wife. She'd moved up from Melbourne as well. So the four of us, yeah, every Monday would meet and try a new coffee shop on the Gold Coast. And it just kind of expanded. So we have, you know, a Facebook group now with all of the, the players' partners and the staff partners. And we do have lots of events. Yeah. Certainly back in the, the year of the Commonwealth Games, when the players and, and everyone was travelling a lot, we would kind of go to the club and, and take over the, the players' lounge and watch the games there and um yeah it's really nice i mean you know the players partners have formed great bonds and yeah. um, our staff partners have too and living on the gold coast it just lends itself to it's a very family friendly place it's easy to catch up it's um easy to have people over and yeah it's been um it's been great to be part of yeah from that perspective in, in such an important year with, yeah. the, with the women's team starting and um yeah i think women are really I do remember, I think, when we first started dating, I did say to Stewie, I'm like, oh, my gosh, you, have, you know, you work with so many men. You need more women in your office. You know, it's just men's team and, you know, a lot yeah. of male staff. Yep. Um, and I think a lot of the issues that come with that, I'm like, if you just dropped a few women in that office, yeah. it would, you know, sort out a lot of those problems. And, and now I think even in the last uh, few it's years... A, it's a different vibe and it's a good one. Um, but good clubs have equal you know, men and women and have kids running around. So I mm. um, always remember as a young kid running around my dad's footy club, but I always think good footy clubs have kids around and, mm. and always welcome and partners as well. So I guess that's the environment myself and John have really tried to drive and everyone's welcome, yeah. I'd like to um, maybe explore that theme a little bit about turning those kids into young men and you know which is a big part of your role Stuart I mean you started playing AFL I think still as a 17 year old which I think you're not even allowed to do anymore I think you've got to be 18 what would you have told 17 year old Stewie Jew on his AFL debut and, and and what do you look for now in a young man to help turn him into a you know a fully rounded individual yeah well I think it's probably 
that, probably that point, a fully rounded individual. Um, I think somewhere between 16 and 17, I was, I was told very early that Port Adelaide were going to pick me up and probably the worst thing that could have happened to me because all of a sudden I'm like, okay, no more homework. I'm going to play football and that's what I'm going to do. So I guess our, what we would like to do is, is we want good stories. So in 10, 15 years, when we hear the names that were at the club when we were here, it's success stories and not guys that put all their eggs in the footy basket and then they struggle to transition. So we're trying, it's a real balance because you get an 18 year old into the club and you want to support, but you don't want it to tip too far where you're doing everything for them. You want them to learn how to be self-sufficient. And so I think, you know, we, we encourage our whole list to have something outside of football. It doesn't need to be study. Um, we've recently negotiated with some trades because obviously with the time commitments, a little bit difficult, but we've been able with the government, get some guys into doing trade work as well because study is not for everyone. And um, this time was interesting too, because the players knew they'd have a little bit more time. So for this semester, a lot of the guys are really motivated and, and ticked off a couple more uni subjects, which was pleasing. So we're probably, I think we're up around 90% of our group is engaged outside of footy. And I think, you know, there's footy's one thing, but if we can keep them engaged off field and have good balance, their footy's going to be better anyway. Whereas I guess when I played, it was you either played well or you played badly. And in Adelaide, sometimes you played badly, you don't really want to come out of your house. You actually would do I was doing isolation a lot in Adelaide. <laughs> <laughs> a few bad games in there, Simon. So <laughs> on a Sunday, you're not going to walk down the street with your chest out because you're going to cop it, that's for sure. <laughs> Very good. And into this uh, complicated picture, and say, please weigh in on this one as well, that comes uh, social media in, in, in the modern day. And, um, and that has its own... Uh, distractions, I, I guess. Uh, what do you say from your own experience in the media, say, to the, to the players and to uh, the people around the club? What, what kind of advice do you have to them and to, to, to basically stay out of trouble? Oh, it, it's such a difficult one, you know, the social media side of things. I know that... Um, uh, and, and I think it really depends on the individual, to be honest, um, and, and what your personality is what you can you know I, I don't know. like when Sri first got the role um Paul Ruse's wife Tammy Ruse uh did and she did sort of meditation sessions for a lot of the coaches wives and sort of as a preparation for perhaps the stresses to come <laughs> and um welcome to the club yeah and, yeah. and that it was it was really you know very helpful and one of the um key messages or tips she gave to me was do not read anything on social media about Stewie. And I thought, well, that is really hard for me because I am on, um, you know, I work in the media, so I use, you know, social media and things quite a, quite a lot. And I sort of thought, well, you know, it's fine. I can deal with that. Like, I've, you know, they've said bad things about Stewie before. That's not going to bother me. Um, but no, I think it is a very real thing. I think it can be very, very damaging and, um, you know, no people in football who have had a terrible time and, you know, the public scrutiny can be um, awful. Um, but again, look, I, I guess the short answer is I don't know. I don't really mm. give anyone advice as to how they should navigate social media. I think it really depends on what you, what makes you feel good. So, you know, for some people, it's probably really unhealthy um, to be on social media. I think you have to take it with a grain of salt. Um, I, I don't, <clears throat> like to en engage too much. I see people sort of get involved in these slanging mm. matches with people who criticise you, and I, I don't think that's helpful. I, um, I think it's it can be a useful tool, social media, um, and uh, you know if it's making you feel bad, then then stop stop using it is the simple thing. But I don't know. You know, it's really again, it's hard. The players they're so much younger than us. Again, mm. we didn't grow up with it. Thank goodness. We often do so. Yeah. Thank. Luckily, while we're eighteen to thirty, there are no there photos. No, no social media. <laughs> um, so yeah, it's a really, really tricky one. I think it it can be really destructive and addictive. And um, I think if they're getting if you if you're relying on that for your self worth, then that that's to me, um, that's a a situation you want to try and 
rectify or at least bring it to attention that that's not the real, you know, it's everyone's best of. We actually, we talked once about, we should actually, something that's just reality, everyone's worst of. Because mm. all you see is everyone's best of, everyone's holidays, everyone's. Yep. Um, and it, some of it's just just rubbish. Mm. Um, Simon, yours are informative and educational. And My kids think they're way too long, Stu. So they, they say, <laughs> just make them much well, shorter. No, well, so, you know, I, I think, so for that, that, it can be used for good and awareness and spreading messages. Um, but and it's, connection and education. And it's, yeah. I think it's really hard to teach. And TikTok. <laughs> What's that doing? <laughs> what is that doing? I don't know. You know, to think that what, what happens... Well, we're going to ask you to do a TikTok dance after this, okay? So. <laughs> <laughs> no. But, yeah, I think it's hard for any 18 or 19-year-old to to explain to them what, you know, what happens now, yeah. what you put out on social media may come back to, to haunt you when you're going for a job and, you know, you have children or wanting to meet a partner or, or something. You don't... You just don't think about that when you're young. It's not relevant to your life right, you know, right now. So it's yeah, it's a it's a tricky. You try thing. and educate around that. That once you do, it's there forever. A bit like the internet, it's there forever. Um, if you then go and do something, you know, that gets you in the media, they're going to grab your worst picture. Mm. Or if you get in trouble, okay, well, there's a picture of you with a beer in your hand. So you know, and, and at different times, like. You know, one of the lads at work, you know, I looked at his Instagram and he, he's a great lad. And I was like, well, every second pitch is with his mates with a beer. And I'm like, it's not really what he's like, but that's sort of what you're telling everyone. Yep. I was, you know, I just said a word to him. I said, look, I know you're not because he's not. Mm. But the, these posts were like, you know, a month or so apart. But I said, just if you didn't know you and then looked at that, what do you reckon? He goes, oh, I actually didn't realise that it was like that. I didn't use it much. But when he did use it was when he was being social. So it's just trying to educate. But they have a lot of fun on it. Like Isaac Rankin plays music and, and that brings, it's good for him. Mm. And people love listening to his music because he's very talented. So I promise you, I'll replace it with mine and it's not gonna move. It always dish their friends and put the love first. Always there when someone was out there worse. But as a time went by, I started to feel like a curse. So it's interesting, you have to walk a fine line, Stu, between being a, a skills coach and a life coach for, for these young men. And I see now, you know, with the, the pandemic, the AFL are maybe putting some rules around uh, maybe their after hours behaviour and, and any romantic kind of uh, notions they might have. But I, I can't imagine how you would navigate that conversation with one of those athletes. I'm, I'm staying well away from that conversation. Um, but it's difficult because we do talk about and we understand the game is getting some some very big social license to be able to get going very quickly um so it's it's a difficult one and we know that we're going to hopefully move with society but the players are very good they understand um now there's 800 and something players in the in the afl 18 to 30 year olds someone's going to make a mistake and it's not going to be by purpose um i'd be very surprised but that's a lot of things. For a month, for that sort of age bracket to stay so disciplined, they're going to try their best. Um, but also, you know, understanding that they're only human and they might make one mistake here and there, but it's it's just their intention, I think, is in the right spot. Sarah, this is maybe a little bit of a, a free kick. The <laughs> AFL is a, a huge business now and they've had to negotiate something that all of society has never had to deal with before in the last couple of months. With all the social media, with all the criticisms, with all the pylons that we get sort of week to week, it must be very difficult at head office. But I think generally speaking, uh, knowing that 18 clubs have their own interests and, and particularly up here on the Gold Coast as they try to get established, but do you think they do a reasonable job? Oh, absolutely. I mean, I think certainly as Stewie said to, with, you know, this COVID example, to be able to navigate their way through this with, yeah, so many uh, different clubs in different states, the, obviously the health restrictions, the travel restrictions, everything. I mean, it's a minefield, really. It, it was interesting. I think when it, 
when it sort of first happened and um, we were seeing all the shutdowns of certain industries, I was really shocked, I guess, that the AFL stopped. You know, you sort of always, I guess, because it's just always been there and it just mm. always seems so strong and it was, um, it was just such a shock, I think. But again, that's replicated across so many industries is out of their hands, really. Um, but yes, yeah, certainly to be able to get back up and running, it kind of seems like it's happened quite quickly, doesn't it? And to, yeah, to get back up and running and certainly with all of the information that they've provided, um, you know, with the clubs constantly. And we, the partners, had a, a Zoom session last night, actually, with, with the club um, just to run through all of the strict restrictions with us. So we sort of know what we're allowed to do and not allowed to do. Um, so I'm not allowed, well, no, you're not allowed to come out to dinner on Friday night. We had a dinner planned with friends, which we... Sarah sure now we has an indefinite babysitter. Yes. <laughs> so, Swings and roundabouts. Exactly, yeah. exactly. So, no, I mean, yeah, I certainly, from a, a personal perspective, feel very well supported by the club and, and then, I guess, you know, which is then the AFLs. When they get through this, Gil and Andrew Dillon and... The, the commission and Steve Hocking, I think they'll sleep very well because mm. when we've tried to work through it, you think about the Prime Minister trying to deal with the Premiers, well, they've got 18 stakeholders who <laughs> all want, they're all different. Like, we're different to Brisbane. Sydney's different to GWS. They've got 10 Victorian teams at WA and everyone wants things to go this way because that works for them. So they're trying to navigate. and I'm, They've done an amazing job, to be honest, and just informing at the right time as best they can but when we try to work through scenarios we're like one problem solve one problem three more open up mm. and i think also to you know given how many job losses there have been just across the nation i think um and for both of us have both been working throughout this time you feel really fortunate you know and in whatever capacity that is or whatever capacity it looks mm. like going forward um, I think, yeah, you, you just do feel quite fortunate. I'm interested, guys, in, in what game day looks like as we come out of this, Stu. I got the impression from your career, you kind of uh, grew an extra leg when the crowd really got behind you and made some noise, you know, at the G or wherever it was. I can't imagine what game day will be like without that all-important aspect, you know, the fans in the stadium. What, what is your take on that? Yeah, it was a little bit different. We had a small taste of it in round one. And um, yeah, it was funny. And, uh, you know, we, we're yet to find out what impact it, is it going to have. It was certainly different, um, no doubt about it. And it could be because the, the game's for the fans, to be honest. I think it was LeBron, when it was all happening and there was talk of NBA with no fans, he's like, no fans? Well, I'm not playing because I play <laughs> for the fans. You know, and I, I, I remember thinking, well, yeah, it's true. Like that... Clubs exist for the fans and the members, um, you know, and yes, it's turned into this big business, but go back to when clubs were clubs and it was for the fans and people to have an attachment. So we feel for um, the fans and our members and all the other clubs as well that can't just go to the footy and that's their release. You know, they might have had a big week at work and they go and let it all out and tell everyone how they should play the game. But, <laughs> you know, I think that that's their release. And then sometimes their week hinges on the result and not being able to have that live connection. Like I know my dad back in Adelaide goes to Central Districts every week. And he, you know, I texted him the other day. I said, oh, I see the SNFL's back on. He said, yeah, but we can't go yet. <laughs> you know, so... Not he's, happy. Yeah, he's happy. <laughs> he's happy it's back on, but... He wants more. He wants to go there and see it and smell it and hear it. So mm. um, that'll be a good day when everyone can come back. Sarah, I'll, I'll aim this one at you. The pressure that exists, we've, we've touched on that already, um, around a footy club and that scoreboard that Stu mentioned before ultimately ends up determining what happens in the longer term as a coach as well. How do you sort of reconcile that? Is there a, a box in the corner of the house, a stress box or whatever that you kind of put a deposit in each week if it's a loss or whatever and, and take one out if it's a win? How do you deal with that? And, and, and the brutal reality of, of being up here on the Gold Coast, starting uh, a, a new life, knowing that you know, ultimately what happens on that scoreboard determines your, your kind of longer term future. 
I guess we came into it with our eyes wide open, really, from every aspect. It, you know, it was something that we'd spoken about for a long time, you know, that, you know, Stewie's goal was to one day be a senior coach and how, you know, what that would look like um, and the stresses that come with that. So we, you know, we came in with our eyes mm -hmm. wide open and the way we approach it is really just to look at the positives and to try and live for today because you just don't know what's going to happen in the future and that's all you really can do and I think we feel um, really fortunate to have this opportunity and we were living in Sydney for many years you know without our families they're back in South Australia so and you know we sort of enjoy I guess traveling around and moving around yeah. so it was kind of a nice adventure for us the timing was great with Frankie our daughter starting school the year we moved up here so that worked out nicely timing wise um and yeah I mean I guess you sort of you know that it's not going to be forever but what is really so you know um obviously yes it's stressful week in week out but again I guess we just sort of look at it pragmatically really it's He's not saving lives. Yeah, I was about to say. <laughs> but, um, no, I don't mean that in a negative way, but yeah, I think no. in reality, you know, yes, we're very passionate about football and passionate about um, this role yeah, big, and uh, absolutely big want big success, week, not uh, just for us, but for the whole club and for the community so, um, who has really been yeah, welcoming so to us yeah. moving up here. Um, but, you know, the reality is sometimes things go your way, sometimes they don't, and sometimes it's completely out of your control. So if that happens to Stewie, you know, in the near future or in the distant future, like it's, you just have to, I guess, look at the positives and we try and remain really grateful for this experience that we have now for however long it lasts. Hopefully it lasts for a long time because we love living up here. Um, but yeah, I think we were, I think we were really well aware of, the potential stresses involved and um, we'd spoken a lot about how we wanted to try and manage that and not let it you know run or ruin our lives mm -hmm. um, and I think we probably made an agreement that if it was ever too awful and stressful that you know we'd you know, divert mm. pivot that's the word isn't it pivot. Yeah, there you go um, but that's good oh, yeah. I mean what you're talking about is mindfulness really isn't it and that's what we're all learning through this COVID-19 thing. Yeah. Yeah. Right. And yeah. I think, yeah, it's, but the season's very much like, I always liken it to, you know, the cartoons when they're running, they're running, falling off a cliff. Me, me. <laughs> and it's going so fast and you're grabbing onto some branches. Well, normally the season, you can't grab too many branches because it's going that fast. Whereas this is actually, you know, just like stop on a ledge and reflect. And, and I think that that, just a bit of reset, but I think Sarah used the word, like, we're really grateful for the opportunity. So it's, yeah, it's a great adventure. It's a great learning opportunity. So, you know, I think we'd just love to leave the club in a better place than when we got there, essentially. Like, that's always everyone's thought or should be everyone's thought when they go into a sporting club or business is, you know, give yourself to it and, and leave it in a better place. Could have been a bad analogy, though, Stu, because of Wiley Coyote. When he when he goes down, he looks up and the anvil's coming behind him, and then squishes <laughs> oh, him. That's why I'm just I'm ready. I'm ready to move, Simon. Just <laughs> yeah, duck out there you go. But Simon, no Wiley always comes. Wiley always comes back next week for more, though. He so, does, you know, John. He's you're right. He bounces back every time. He gets blown up every week too, doesn't he? <laughs> you need a act. You need a acme box with you at, at yeah, work. Yeah, That's we it. do. We do. And I think it's a, you know the bigger the risk, the bigger the reward. Fast forward to sort of Christmas 2020. You guys are sitting around probably a South Australian wine and enjoying you know your lovely family time. What are the things, Stuart and Sarah? You want to? Yeah, there we go. I'm sure. It's, <laughs> I'm sure it's South Australian. We need um, sponsors, Stu, so you can say a <laughs> brand there if you uh, want. What, what was this one? Um, you know what? It is a South Australian oh, wine. Sure. I was there for a friend's 40th before COVID shut down. Um, Sean, uh, Sean Smith. Yeah, Sean Smith it is. Yeah. Sean Smith? Yeah, love yeah it. I think so. Well, we love their work. One of my um, favourites. Yeah. <laughs> what are the things sort of collectively that you guys sort of tick off and look back and say, you know, we, yes, COVID was bad and it disrupted everything, but... You know, what, what are the things that you want to get out of the rest of the year for the team and uh, and more broadly, do you think? Oh, 
I just think constant improvement. You know, I think for us, we're, we're going to have the youngest list. I think in round one, we average 56 games versus Port Adelaide 108. So, you know, I think people are saying, oh, Port, a bit of a young team. Well, they averaged 108 games and we were 56. I think, you know, our average age was 22 and a bit. So I think we've got, just got to keep building. And we've turned the list over. So, you know, Jared Witts, our captain the other day, just said, it's great to look around the locker room and know that everyone in there is in. And, and no one's having second thoughts about what why should I be next year. It's like, this is the group. Now it's about actually not just getting games for individual players. It's actually getting games together and getting that synergy. So that's what we're looking forward to the most as a club. And, you know, working with these guys, I think they're really committed. They all love the club now. Like it's, you know, and guys have moved on. And I understand that because they were here for a little bit and probably needed a change. Like, you know, people in businesses do as well. So I think we were pretty clear on making sure that whoever wants to be here, let's let's lock in and, and get the overalls on and get to work. So if we've uh, significantly improved and, and built that cohesion, I think then that lays a good foundation. But we always knew it was going to take a couple of years to get to that the start line. Yeah, and I think if we are sitting in South Australia at Christmas time, yeah, enjoying our South Australia, yeah, I'll be looking back and go, wow, we, we were allowed on a plane. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> true. <laughs> I'll just be happy with that, I think. It's an exciting time, though, to be here on the Gold Coast. So I think with the possibility maybe even of the Olympics coming to Southeast Queensland in, in 2032, uh, and I'm not just saying this because we've lived here for 10 years and jono has been here much longer than, than we have, but it is a truly beautiful part of the world. And people down south, uh, I know the Victorians have been coming up here for many, many years, but there is a sense that good things are happening up here. Oh, absolutely. I mean, it's such, we, we just fell in love with the Gold Coast mm. straight away. It was like, it, I sort of describe to people when you come up here, it's like just being enveloped in a big hug, you know, from the sort of hustle bustle of Sydney. And it's just, it's amazing how many people still don't realise what the Gold Coast is like as a place to live. Even some of our good friends are like, ah, yeah. oh, do you like live in Surfers Paradise? They just think of, mm. you know, Cavill Avenue and they think of the you know, theme parks and the, yeah, high rises of yeah. Surfers Paradise. And it's, it's so much more than that. It is, it, it's an amazing place to live. It's, it's a lot more going on yeah. than I guess I probably realised as well, though, if I'm honest. And the diversity of industry not only industry but mm. you know different entrepreneurs and opportunities so and a lot of the people we've met and certainly i have through the football club of that come from melbourne and they came here you know to live for two years and that was 20 25 years ago and they've just never left and they some people will think a little bit protective of you know, keep it as a little secret don't tell everyone how good it is <laughs> because we don't want it to get too busy yeah um, whereas we're we're advocates, we spread the word. Yeah, we do. I mean, it is. It just it has everything. Like it just really, you know, from the hinterland, restaurants, beach. I mean, it's the climate. It's particularly for a young family, any stage of life. You can just you've got Brisbane up the road. Um, and as you mentioned, you know, with as well as we mentioned before about the the four interstate AFL teams coming up here for a while, that would be a great opportunity to showcase the region. And I'm sure the young players will enjoy spending a a winter up here where it, you know, dips to a chilly 22 degrees or whatever it is. Mm -hmm. And then, yeah, with the, the prospect of the Olympics, it's certainly an exciting um, region, definitely. And we, we sort of hope that the tourism industry can bounce back quickly because obviously it's been a, a hard time for them and the region does rely on, on tourism a lot. It's a fantastic place to live. We absolutely love it. And Stewie, all those foreign teams coming in, you're not going to be getting in their ear and saying, how good's it up here, boys? You know, <laughs> not a bad place to live. Oh. Just saying. Yeah. I know, I know. It's, um, we're, we're rolling out a semi-red carpet for some of them. We, think we might be able to share. We're, we're very lucky. We've got three ovals we can use and a couple of gyms. So I know a couple of teams are locked in at different locations. But, um, yeah, there was one player we were talking to last year um, and, it, and it didn't, quite happened but um i just texted him i said i knew we'd, we'd get you to the gold coast eventually <laughs> it wasn't that five was it <laughs> oh no 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 that'd be nice Damn. <laughs>
<laughs> Can't I'll say too much. Might have some pull there, Simon. At three oh. now, just get in his ear. Hey, I know people. I know people. <laughs> <laughs> Dear me, fantastic. <laughs> Well, look, it's just been absolutely wonderful, Simon. I, I've, I've had an absolute blast. I don't know if you've got anything left to add, but it, uh, it's been a delight chatting to you guys. I guess probably to Stuart and Sarah, the last question I'd ask, what's the message for the Gold Coast Suns fans in 2020? What's, what's the key thing you'd like them to know? Well, I think we'd love you to know, I guess, for our fans, is that you know we've put in a body of work over the summer and that the players are really motivated. And I think that... You know, we've got to keep banging on that rock and eventually that'll crack. And I think that, you know, when will that be? Is it 10 weeks? Is it 20? Is it the start of next year? Um, but they should take heart in the fact that we've got a highly motivated group of young men that are committed to each other. I've been at many a clubs and I can say hand on heart that our players are connected to the club, connected to the region now. So if that's our starting point, well, then things will happen from here. Yeah, and I'd just say thank you. Thank you for welcoming us. You know, we've, we've just enjoyed our time here already so far. So, yeah, and look forward to seeing you all again at the game at soon, the game. hopefully. Won't that, be good. Yeah. Won't that be good? I think we all want that routine back again. I, I, I sort of said to the family early on in this piece, you know, I will never complain about a boring Sunday ever again because uh, I want boring Sundays back again where I have a choice of what's, what footy games to watch from the couch or whatever, just bring it back. Look, thank you both for uh, for being a part of this. You can unlock uh, Frankie and Jack from the room that you've had them locked in uh, the last hour. So I think I can hear them screaming in the background. There was a little bit of noise a couple of times. I thought, we're going to get a little visitor over my shoulder. But, um, I know, that's very good. I'll bet you Frankie, Frankie would be up listening and she'll be saying, what was that question? Yeah, what they yeah. yeah we'll get, what did we'll he ask that for? That. Yeah. Stewie, have either of them got a really strong left foot? Just asking for a friend. Well, <laughs> Jack, well, Frankie kicks with her left and then Jack kicks with his right. So, um, fix that. Yeah, I've, I've just been saying, I'll just try, just try your left a little bit more. <laughs> so he's actually not bad on both now. So, he's only four. So, I'm going to get my, my inner Demir Dokic and we'll get there in a few years. That's it. <laughs> I hear that excuse, he's only four all the time, Stewie, and that's loser talk. <laughs> I won't accept it. Stuart, Sarah, it's been an absolute, absolute delight. Thank you for joining a couple of madmen, Simon and I, on the couch in the podcast tonight. And it's been a delight. And we wish you all the, all the success in the future. And we look forward to uh, seeing footy back bigger and better and uh, go the Suns in 2020 and beyond. Indeed. Yeah. Thank you both. Thank you so much for having us. Thank you.